Hi everyone, I'm Stan Mallow. Welcome to Paranormal Yacker. My guest on today's show, who I'll be yakking with, is Reverend Ellen Bourne. She is an RN as well as a renowned medium and psychic. We'll be discussing meditation, healing mudras, the power of Kundalini, angels and archangels. Reverend Ellen Bourne, welcome to Paranormal Yacker. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to this. Great. Totally mutual. Now, Ellen, uh, you are a former president of the Lilydale Assembly, the largest spiritualist community in the world, the founding pastor of the Light of Truth Church in Buffalo, New York, and teach a wide range of esoteric topics. Uh, do you recall when you first became interested in spiritualism and what sparked that interest? Oh my goodness. Well, when I was age eight, I was seeing spirits, but that was a long time ago and there wasn't any books or anything to tell me what it was. And I was afraid to tell people because I thought they would think I was cuckoo. Because when you're age eight, your invisible friends are like going away. When you're four, it's okay. <laughs> so, um, Long story short, I had many different psychic experiences and awakenings, but when I was age 17, I took a class in high school on sociology. And it turns out that my teacher's mother-in-law was a medium at Lilydale. And so he brought up Lilydale in the class because it's a very different place to live from a sociological perspective. And then I knew I had to go there. So I borrowed my mother's car within weeks and drove there. I mean, I was a new driver. I wasn't that old. And I thought, oh, my God, there's all these people here like me. I'm not so alone in my uh, perception. So that made a huge impact on me. And I kept going there. I've been there for almost 50 years in the summer. I've owned a house there. I've been the president, taught classes. It's a very important place for me. And wow. for many other people who come there and want to learn about all this. Oh, Absolutely. Uh, now, because you're knowledgeable in many areas and teach them, including training people how to develop their own gifts for the sake of time constraints, I'm honing in on just a few of them, as mentioned when I introduced you. So here goes. What's the importance of meditation, and is there a right and wrong way to meditate? Okay, yes, there is a right and wrong way to meditate. But there's many different styles of meditation, and they're all correct. It just depends on where you are at, but it also depends on a lot of people meditate and listen to a guided meditation tape instead of just being silent within and focusing on yourself. And it's not that it's wrong to do that, but you, it's more powerful to do it without that. But it's a good beginning. You have to start somewhere. And... Um, Meditation is linked to the ability of mediumship because you have to put yourself in a certain state of mind in order to receive the, and get out of your own way, in order to receive the information from angels and spirits and other entities that are on the other side of life. Uh, what is a mudra? How are they used in the healing process? And what type of maladies are they used to heal? physical, spiritual, emotional, or all manner of ailments? All the above. But I wouldn't say if you have a physical problem, you should still go to a physician. I'm not saying do a mudra instead, because I mm -hmm. think it's in combination with other things. That solo is, would be sort of foolish. And they're, the kind of mudras I do, hand mudras, they involve the use of the hands. And so, for example, if I place my hands up here, and do a certain breath while I'm doing this, this can help break an addiction. Other, I mean, it isn't the solo thing. I'm not saying don't go for medical help, but they mm -hmm. should be, it's my opinion, they should be using that. And these drug and alcohol, I mean, I've worked in one as, as a nurse, so I understand it, but it would be a little easier for people, I think, to overcome. They just added that teeny thing. For people who want to do it, it's not mandatory. But these things do work and they, you know, it's just, there's millions of them. And if you've ever seen statues of Buddha or anybody's look, his hands are always different. Sometimes they're like this, sometimes like, those all mean different healing things. Oh, 
Wow. Okay. So I think when people start looking at statues of Buddhas, they'll look at it in a different uh, way. I'll just say in San Francisco, there's a huge Asian art museum. In Cleveland, they have a large collection of Buddhist sculptures, but you can even look at them online. You don't have to go anywhere. And you'll see that the postures that Buddha is in are not always identical because he's doing a healing mudra, bringing in energy of a certain type. Now in yoga studios and yoga shows all over the planet, everyone it seems is talking about and praising the power of Kundalini. Yes. Uh, since Kundalini is one of the courses you teach, can you tell my viewers what is Kundalini and what is there about it that makes it so powerful? Well, there's a certain part of us that is invisible. Like your spiritual body, you can't see that on somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, which if you look at anybody, you can't tell. I'm not saying even religion, just whatever their belief system is. Some people mm -hmm. have them and some people don't. But you can't tell by looking at somebody whether they have that or what it is. Or most people can't. So let's say you decide to get into that through meditation or through going to church or because in a lot of churches, they do have a silent prayer that's called meditation. Even in the Catholic church has a silent prayer in their mass. It's really all the same. It's just a different language. But at any rate, most people in the silent prayer talk to their own understanding of God. Oh, please, you know, do this, do this, do that. They don't listen. Meditation is the opposite. You're tuned in, but you're listening. And it isn't that the second you do it, you hear this voice saying, hello, here we are. It doesn't work that way. But your intuition, your impressions, your discernment, your confidence, your peace of mind, it all improves by doing that. So when your kundalini is, is um, from the Hindu, okay, and it shows that there's like a, a picture of a snake, but it's coiled up at the bottom of your spine. And when you start to meditate, it sort of starts to open and rise until it hits um, different sensitive points in the body and it makes you more aware of what's going on, of yourself, of what is the best way to manage things. And so when the, that's more the idea of not your intelligence, but your wisdom is affiliated with Kundalini, which is quite different than your um, intellectual body. Kundalini, from your description of it, if I know about it, is indeed very, very very powerful. Yes. So if somebody say did it without training or in the supervision of somebody like yourself, can it not be dangerous? Yes, it can. Because sometimes people reach too far up too soon. So for example, pretend you have a torch year lamp with a hundred watt light bulb in it. Okay. If you want to put a 300 watt bulb in there, you have to rewire the the uh, lamp or it's going to blow out. And that's what happens to people too when they go too fast. Or like someone learning to drive a car and they're driving at 90 and they've never driven before. It's ridiculous. You're over your ability to, con to be in control of yourself. What you're saying, I think, is very important for the viewers to, to listen to and to heed. Because, you know, many times things are, quote unquote, in like Kundalini. Uh, but there can be dangers, obviously, from doing it on your own. So it's very important that or sweat lodges or anything else like that. Oh, we absolutely. Happen. The only time I ever was involved with a sweat lodge, the person conducting it was a physician. So if somebody became, you know, it was too much for them, he would make them get out before there was a problem and he knew what to do. So I wouldn't just do that with just anybody. Agree with you totally. And I'm glad you brought that out. And if somebody's interested, you know, in Kundalini, they should go with a skilled person like yourself who knows how far to take it and when to withdraw. Yes, but when you're teaching meditation, people's Kundalini is rising a little bit. But uh -huh. you don't want to the next day quit your job and go meditate 24-7. That's <laughs> ridiculous. But there are people who do such things, and it's not recommended. Okay, glad we covered that. Now, angels have been around for thousands of years. Yes. Perhaps from the beginning of time itself or before. Uh, what, in your opinion, is an angel? Where did they come from? How did they come to be? Uh, what is their purpose? And what is the difference 
between an angel and an archangel. Oh, okay. Well, that's a lot of questions. But I, just, I know. I, I just realized I should have done one at a time. No, but that's fine. I but yeah. I'm just going to say Kundalini has been around for 5,000 years too. Kundalini, wow. it's been around forever. It's not new. It may become hip right now, but it's very old. So mm -hmm. if you go to India or places where the religion is more practiced, it's part of the common conversation, like you see a cross in the United States on a church. It looks normal to people because they're used to it. But at any rate, angels are beings that were created, let's just say in the Big Bang when the earth was created, mm -hmm. but they don't have enough gravity, like weight in their soul to drop as far down into the gravity of the earth. So they stay at a level that's very close to, um, let's say the higher spiritual level. And archangels are in charge of things in life. Like think of a university. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get a PhD, these people would be like the PhD professors that specialize in like math or, you know, whatever you want to study. And then the angels sort of are their helpers or they're, they're like the graduate students, the TAs in a college that are can help you, but archangels are more powerful. And Michael, Archangel Michael or Saint Michael, is the CEO of the archangelic world. He's in charge of all the archangels and all the angels. And so if you have to learn something or you're struggling with something on the earth plane, let's say, I don't know, whatever it is, a lot of people are struggling because of COVID right now, but ordinary life problems keep occurring just because it's COVID doesn't mean you don't get in a fight with your sister-in-law or something. But <laughs> right. anyway, or whatever they can be they won't work with you without your permission you have to ask and it just could be as simple as hey saint michael help me but michael is in charge of protection not just of your body but of like the people who come like a guard okay and that's why people in the military service and law enforcement officials often wear a Michael or have a tattoo of Michael the Archangel because they're like in battle and in dangerous physical situations. Where, for example, Raphael the Archangel has to do with healing. So for people who are ill, and I remember when I first started working at the hospital a long time ago, sometime a person would have a piece of tape and have a prayer card of um, that angel taped on the door of the room because it was a blessing over the staff, the doctor, and not just the patient, and all the people who took care of them for a better outcome. And that practice is long gone. But so people can use, because angels are very helpful, but you have to get out of your way and let them work. And a lot of people, as I tell people, all your angels are sitting flapping their wings on the unemployment line. So mm -hmm. give them a job. They're waiting for you call them to work. They'd be more than happy. It's like an unemployed person who wants a job. I love how you explain things. I got to tell you that you do it in everyday language that, that people can understand and, that, and that's appreciated. Thank you for that. That's, that's good. Well, I think you're able to reach more people that way. These things aren't that complicated, even though a lot of the old books you read use all this language. But if you can't explain it in a simple way, then you don't get it yourself. That's mm -hmm. what I think. But you say it makes sense. Now, when it comes to angels, there is much talk about guardian angels. Everyone seems to think or hope that they have one. Yes. Does everyone have a guardian angel? And if they do, how does one find out who that guardian angel is? Well, and how do they go about communicating with them? Well, you may communicate with them, but not know who they are. And you might have a change up. Let's say when you're a child, your childhood conditions are uh, whatever. I'm from mm -hmm. Buffalo, New York with our chicken wings. So I'll say, are your childhood conditions hot, medium, or mild? So let's say you have a hot situation, which means it's not that stable. Then you might have a certain angel that's there to guide you, but you have to listen and, um, and stay out of its way because sometimes They'll tell you, like, I just did a reading this morning with a lady, and one of her guardians is um, St. Mary of Knock, who is more from the Catholic Church, but she's, and the idea is St. Mary of Knock keeps silent. Even when you're in a situation, you observe and you don't talk because that's your best, and that's a challenge, because when somebody's throwing the gauntlet down, most people's response is to not be that calm and to say something, but not anything inciting. Like, you know, I heard that or thank you for saying that or whatever, which is hard to do. But, and then as you move along in life, you get a different um, 
Just like going to college. Your math professor this semester is not going to be your poetry teacher in the next semester because they're in a different department. Or for example, pretend you're studying, I'm going to pick on Mozart for a minute. A lot of people feel that Mozart had some kind of help. Because if you look at the movie Amadeus, which is old, he heard all the orchestrations simultaneously. And he wrote down everything only once. That's true in this movie. And there was never an erasure. So how did he even possibly do this? Many people think he had a musical attunement from an archangel that just sort of fed him the... And many people, if you have a hobby and you're really into it, I don't care if it's bird watching or baking or whatever... When you're doing what you love, the time passes like this. You go, oh my God, I've been doing this for three hours. Felt like 15 minutes. That's when you're in your zone. So everybody has to find what that is for themselves. And the angels sort of hook you up or train you or help you to find a place where your creativity and your soul's expression and your inner happiness are connected to your outer life. So your life is like more blended together. You don't go to a job you hate every day or you need to change your attitude or find another job. But because then you're working against yourself and many people have that feeling, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, Ellen, next question I have for you, you sort of answered, but maybe you'll elaborate a bit more on it. Uh, when I've spoken with people who are aware of their guardian angel, most seem to connect most with Michael than Gabriel or Raphael or any of the other angels. Or Uriah. What do you Those think are is the, the reason? Four angels, even though Uriah is non canonical, not in the Bible. But that's true. That is true. But also, I call on them episodically. Like if I know someone's ill that I know, in addition to writing their name maybe in a prayer list, I ask Archangel Raphael to go and put a blessing on that person because they don't need me worrying about them, then I'm sending them my fear and negativity. But some people have other guardian angels that like work together, sort of like coaches, if you think of athletics. You know how in a mm -hmm. professional team, they have different coaches for different skills, depending mm -hmm. on what you need to learn to play football? Well, that's what it's sort of like. Sometimes they send you to a different coach, but your mainline ones are there. Now, uh, next question, if you don't want to answer it, that's okay. But out of curiosity, do you know who your guardian angel is? Yes, but one of them is Michael, but I have another one that's a little more personal. And how but I'll tell you, you something. Mm -hmm. If you're working, okay, pretend you're a scientist and you're mm -hmm. trying to discover the cure for a disease. And everybody around the whole world in all these countries, all in their laboratories are doing the same thing. And all of a sudden, in some country somewhere, somebody announces, I have this. Within one week, all the other labs say, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, why is that? I think that's unique. It's because the angels are opening up the universe to allow somebody who's tuned into this, and then they prove this person's right, and maybe it generates a cure to help humanity. That's mm -hmm. one thing they do. Like if you're studying something, you might get an archangel that's a fill, like broadcasting, maybe you have somebody. Now, um, how long have you been aware of the angels that are around you? Probably since I was 13. Ah, very young. Yes, but I had my first experience when I was eight. And so at that time, I became a li obsessed with going to the library because I thought that someone in the universe must have written a book about what this is. And if I could find this book, it would tell me what this all was. So I read tons and tons of books, which, of course, didn't reveal it. So at that time, when I was eight years old, I had two life goals. One was to become a librarian, get a job in the Smithsonian Library, so on my lunch hour, I could eventually find the book. Or the other one, I liked to ice skate. And my other one was to be in the Walt Disney Ice Capades. But at any rate, neither one of them happened, but that's okay. In what situations have you called upon your angels for help and guidance? Well, I, when I wake up, I call them. But for a long time, I worked in the emergency room of a major local hospital. And so you can't say these things aloud, but I'd call them in over patients. Or sometimes the angel would show me what was wrong with the person before the doctor found out. And so you have to be very careful of, um, you don't want to overstep people or have people think you're invalid. So I had to use it silently and in a very cautious manner. But sometimes, depending on the doc, you could say, hey, have you thought it might be this? As long as you're taking a blood test, let's put another check mark here. It's not another tube, no harm done. And then would come out something that gave a clue. 
to the doctor. So that's cool. I, so I used it every single day when, I mean, I work there and I use it in my practice too, because when someone comes in for a reading, I try and call out their people for them, mm -hmm. whether it's like their father or, you know, whatever it is crossed over that they want to get a message from or their angel trying to direct them for a better life path for themselves so I use them all the time I have this whole other conversation going on that's sort of invisible now I know your reputation is incredible you've helped a lot of people and are continuing to help people uh, before you get involved in a session is there anything that you do any ritual any prayer any meditation because it has to take a lot of energy from you to connect. It doesn't. Well, I'll tell you what. It depends how you do it. The okay. idea, no, I always open with a prayer every session. Mm -hmm. And it's usually um, a prayer of protection and safety because you don't want extraneous things coming in. But before the person gets there or the morning before I look at my book, I sort of meditate a little bit on each client that's coming, see what I get. And then I say the prayer at the beginning of the session along with the date. And then I begin. But the point is you don't use your own energy to do a reading. You tune in up there, you bring that energy. I'll call it the Holy Spirit for lack of a better term, because mm -hmm, most people sure. know what that means. You bring that energy down through you and you listen and they do the reading. You're just the voice. So again, you brought up something else that's very important. Uh, like certain things we're talking about for our in and people do it uh, without knowing what the consequences could be. Same thing when it comes to mediumship channeling, etc. People have to be very careful that they go with the white light, not go with darkness. They bring in the right spirits uh, to them. Right. But in the beginning, you're not that practiced. It's like, don't get a driver's license. You first go to the grocery store. You don't drive 2,000 miles to Florida without in it, yeah. with by yourself. So it's the same thing, is that everything, like when you back out of the driveway, you look. That's protection. It's one of the first things they teach you when you learn to drive. Look around before you pull out. So it's the same thing. Just because it's something spiritual doesn't mean that common sense does not apply. Because um, you wouldn't, if I told everybody listening to open their front door and invite the first person in that you see that walks down your street for a coffee, whether you know them or not, that would be a really stupid recommendation. And <laughs> So if you don't do it down here, don't do it up there. It's just simple. <laughs> that, that's great down home advice. That is good. Now, your first experience, like you said, you were eight years old, very young. Did you share it with anyone, friends, family members? Or no, not at the yourself? time. Because, no, not at the time, because I was afraid that someone would think there was something wrong with me. Because it was mm -hmm. not in my family. There was no conversation I ever heard in my whole life that involved spirits or anything like that. So I was sort of afraid that some... I, something bad would happen to me or whatever. Somebody would think I was a kook, which some people wow. still do, but now it doesn't bother me. <laughs> yes. Okay. You've learned, right? And when I say said it, right? To thine own self be true. There's validity in that. That's for sure. And I think if more people were themselves, that would be great. Yes. But that's what part of the purposes of meditation to become your true self and come in alignment with that. And then your life's a lot nicer. I, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I hope you write a book one one day I'll have you on the show about that. All these bits of wisdom that you have, because it makes, because it says you take some complicated things or things that are sometimes put across as being complicated and putting it in everyday terms that people could understand it. So thank you very you. much. You just gave me a reading. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, I hope, and there are going to be witnesses to this. Remember that. I will. Okay, I'm going to take you up on it and remember to come on my show. I definitely will. Because I think there is a need for what you're doing. Absolutely. Now, um, should any of my viewers want to book a reading with you, learn about your classes, the various services you offer, and upcoming events you'll be at, how do they go about contacting you? Well, if you want to go on my website, you can make an appointment, sign up for my newsletter. And a lot of the te classes I'm teaching now um, are online and so you don't have to live in my vicinity in order to attend and my private readings are online also i can do them on zoom on the phone or not so much in person with covid but i will be going back to that when it's suitable 
at least in Buffalo, because in the summer you can do it outside, but when the winter comes, we won't be sitting outside in the snow. Buffalo is a lovely, lovely city, much underrated, regretfully. I agree. But it's up and coming. But that's now, why I like to travel to tropical places, so it makes a good balance. So I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned people could contact you on your website, but you did not give it out. It's sure. Rev, R-E-V, Ellen Bourne, B-O-U-R-N. It's just all small, no punctuation at gmail.com. Okay, very good. I thank you for that. Of course, I know if we did this show as was, they're going to say, how do I contact her? Okay. Yeah, now thank you, you for them. bringing that yeah. up. I appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. I'd like to be able to help more folks. Great. I mean, it seems it's part of your DNA, part of who you are. You get a joy. You just don't do it. There's joy coming from you. I think it it's fun. Yeah, I like it. And it's very rewarding. If you can help somebody, that's nice, too. Great. Now, uh, Reverend Ellen Bourne, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. It's been a joy yakking with you, absolutely. I look forward to future interviews with you so we can discuss other esoteric subjects that you excel in, and so many of them. So I thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Stan Mallow, host of Paranormal Yakker, an exciting free YouTube series that explores everything from ghosts to UFOs. To view the series, just click on any of the photo thumbnails below. I would greatly appreciate it if you subscribe to my free YouTube channel. All you have to do is click on the subscribe for free button at the top of this page. Thanks.